Now, that's interesting because Israel already had a king, remember? Name was, anybody want to throw it out? Anybody, anybody bring it? Oh, Saul, look at this. Some people actually pay attention. I love this. Okay, so Saul was already the king, and David was anointed. So they technically have two anointed kings. Now, Saul wasn't told directly he'd been anointed, but he pretty much figured it out. And last week, there's this big battle. If you remember, there was a giant that had called out the nation of Israel. And he said, just send somebody down. We will fight one-on-one. -on -one. The winner becomes the winner. And the loser, well, their whole country serves the other, right? And this has been going on for days. And David shows up, not because he's there to fight, because he's there to beat his brothers. He hears this challenge. And he says, how can we ignore this? So he goes to Saul and he says, I'm going to go in and fight. Saul says, here's all my armor. David says, no, I'm going to fight like a shepherd because that's all I know. In the back of Saul's mind, I can't help but think he thinks David's going to die. He sends him out into this battle. David wins, right? Our story today picks up like five minutes later. It came about when he finished speaking to Saul um, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Now, has anybody ever had a friend that just happened? You didn't go looking for a friend. It's just one day you didn't know them, and the next day you are the best of friends. Anybody ever done that? Some of us have been there. Yeah. There's something about when souls connect, right? It just, it just seems right. And here, David's in this new place. And Saul has told him, you don't get to go home, partially because having this great warrior that just took on a giant by himself as a child is a great PR stunt for us. So we're going to keep him around. You don't get to go home. So in that kind of court life, he runs into a guy named John. And John, not only did he have court life, and he had access to Saul. But on top of that, he was a soldier, right? And they meet, and they become the best of friends almost immediately. In fact, verse 3 says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself to the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including a sword and his bow and his belt. Now, we're going to stop for just a second. If I were to... Go to Dusty's house and say, Dusty, you and I are best friends. And I take off my coat, and I take off my shoes, and I hand him my pocket knife, maybe even my belt, right? Might he think I've lost my mind? Maybe, right? Maybe. You see, not only has culture changed, but this symbol is a very prevalent one in that society. He gave his coat, he gave his sword, he gave his bow. What that means is your life is as valuable as mine and I will put myself between you and danger. When looked at from that perspective, when Jonathan and David said there was a soul love between them, it starts making sense, right? You know, society today, you see the word love, you see two men in this passage and it has the word love. Society today says what? Yes, it becomes romantic, right? Yet, if Dusty came to my house and said, Pastor, I love you and I'm worried about your family and he handed me a shotgun to hang on my wall off of his collection, would you say, Dusty has passionate love for Pastor Chris. Probably not. Some people are saying yes. There's passion there, right? It's love, yes. Is it romantic? Probably not. I mean, uh, probably not. Now, so here is the same kind of thing. Yet we as Westerners would hate to put the word love on that relationship because of these connotations. They and John are not scared of that. That's exactly what's happening. They have this soul bond connection. So much so that Jonathan is willing to die for David. Now, before we say it's all personal, David has also become a symbol of the power of the nation, right? He's defeated Goliath. And so not only is he standing up for, I'm going to watch your back politically. I'm going to watch your back personally, militarily. And as your career progresses, I will be there for you through all of it. 
Now, I don't want to get too personal and get into your personal life too much, but does anybody have a friend who's been with them when times were good and when times were bad? Does anybody have a friend that was only there when you had money in your pocket? <laughs> only when you had a smile on your face, right? You see, this kind of love between these two men was, I'm willing to die, meaning on your worst day, I'll be there. By the way, you're going to be king soon, so there's good days to come too. I get that. But the symbol was, when things are bad, I'll be your boy, right? I'll be right there. I love that because you see, everything in David's life has just changed. He was a shepherd boy with a whole bunch of older brothers telling him what to do. In fact, a mom and dad putting him out watching sheep. He becomes anointed. Everybody thinks that's crazy. So much so that when the battle was happening, he wasn't even invited, right? He shows up to serve his older brothers, winds up winning, and his whole life flips over. Saul says, you don't even get to go home. It's court life for you. He doesn't know how to handle it. And Jonathan steps in the gap for him. I have my first point is if you don't have one of these Jonathans in your life, ask God to give it to you. Because if you don't have it, that may be because you're supposed to be Jonathan. That makes sense? Because you should have friendships like this that go this deeply. Let's continue and see why this is going to be important. It's going to play out a little more. Greater love has no one than this in John chapter 13, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer will I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I called you friends. For all things I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. We just changed speakers, right? Who's the new speaker? This is Christ. We jumped ahead about 2,000 years. And Christ is talking about the same concept. And he says, no greater love has this than a friend laid down his life for a friend. And I've done that for you. You're no longer servants of his. He says, you are now not master and servant relationship. You are now friends. For 2,000 years, up until this time, the temple had determined exactly how close you could be to God, right? If you sinned in your life or you were getting married or if you had someone you loved pass away, perhaps, you would go to temple and priests would stand before you and the Father. So that relationship was based on how much, I don't want to say how much you gave, but what your sacrifice looked like, right? Here he goes way past that and says, no, we're just going to be friends. You know, what I find very interesting is there are certain places in society where this dynamic still happens. And I'll give you a quick example. If Chuck and I, hi Chuck, if Chuck and I were to walk into the police department tomorrow and say, I'd like to talk to Detective Nichols, and we go find a Detective Nichols, I'm going to pretend there's one there, I'm sure there is. Um, and we're going to walk in and Chuck and I will find it. We'll sit down and said, I brought you a cup of coffee, and we begin to talk about nothing. How long until we get kicked out? <laughs> right. They would say, do you have a report? No, 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 I'm going to tell you that Chuck and I are going bass fishing next week, and gonna, we're trying to decide which, exactly which outboard motor to get. What do you think? And we wouldn't last, I don't know, five minutes, right? Now let's turn it the other way because you see, Bai spent her life in the police station. What are the chances that Bai can walk in and spend an hour talking to guys? A little higher, right? This is what he's talking about. He says, I used to call you master and servant. Now I'm calling you friends. So much so that I'm willing to lay down my life for you, right? Officer Nichols wouldn't give us five minutes to shoot the breeze with. Yet for Bai, who knows, right? Might jump on a landmine. Because there's this difference. And so here he says the same thing is true for your relationship with your God now. This is revolutionary. Now let's jump back to David. So David went wherever Saul sent him. That's awesome, right? Everything, by the way, is looking up for David, don't you think? It just looks amazing. He's going to have the best career ever. Let's see. And he prospered. 
also good. Whatever job Saul gave him, he did well. Sounds amazing. And Saul set him over men of war. So he's moving up, right? He becomes, you know, a, a, a captain of some sort. He's got some men underneath him. And, and he was pleasing in the sight of all the people <clears throat> and also in the sight of all of Saul's servants. Man, there's not many reports in the Bible that are just as clear. Everything is going swimmingly for David. Now, do you see a problem brewing? What might that problem be? Yeah, you're right, Vi. There, there is this court relationship where theoretically Jonathan could have been a, a, a negative part of his life, and he's not. Here, um, yeah, that's exactly true. Saul begins to kind of groom him, right? Send him out on the path, do these things, get ready. And, and everything has worked out really well um, for David. Um, so much so that it's going to be a problem. So this is point number two. When you're put in a new role and you do well, how do you as an individual handle it? Sidebar, at work, somebody gets a job just like yours and they do better than you. How do you handle that? One more, you're coming to the end of your career and they hire a 20 year old below you and they begin to get promoted and everybody talks about it. How do we handle that? Now hold on to all those ideas. Let's see how Saul handles. It happened as they were coming in when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women out of all the cities of Israel were singing and dancing. Sounds great, right? All the ladies come out and they sing and dance. We talk about later David's going to come in the city singing. It's going to be a problem. But here they're coming back from this battle and all the ladies come out. And they got tambourines and they've written a song just for them. It sounds great. Let's listen to the song. They came out, they're singing and they're dancing. They come out to meet Saul with his tambourines. And there was joy and there was musical instruments. And the women sang as they praised. And they said, Saul has slain his thousands. Huge praise. David his ten thousands. How many battles has David been in? One. One. <laughs> How many men did he knock down? One. One. Now, we know that at the end of the battle, the Israelites, they, they, they routed the Philistines. So maybe 10,000 people died. We're not sure. But is this song even accurate? Not really, right? Of the two, which one is a better war hero at this point? Certainly Saul, right? Certainly. Yet, David is proclaimed as having killed his tens of thousands and Saul his thousands the question is, why would they say that if it's blatantly a lie? What do you think? Ooh. Yeah, he's kind of, I, mean, I don't want to call David the flavor of the month, but there's something very interesting right now. They see God moving through David, right? Something that nobody in the nation was willing to face. He walked out with a stick and a piece of leather, right? And came out on top. You know, I've stood on this very stage and proclaimed the fact that the Chicago Cubs are the greatest baseball team in the history of man. I, I've said it from right here. There are people in this room that might argue with me. Why? Because they won like one World Series in the last 50 years. I know. But uh, having said that, the year they won, how excited was Pastor Chris? and the jersey and the whole deal, right? It's easy for me to go, they've just, they, they have just slaughtered his tens of thousands, right? It, it's this hyperbole kind of concept. We do the same thing with our normal life, right? Brother Glaza got a new car last year. And I love it, by the way. Beautiful car. Exactly what I would buy for myself if you ran for all this time. But I want to be a beautiful car. When he pulled it off the lot, how perfect was it? Probably pretty perfect, right? Five miles on it or something. If you were to look at that car today, I might still cover it. You might still cover it. It might still run beautifully. Is it showing condition? Probably it's a used car now. You drive it off the lot, it loses 
$10,000, right? That might be a little much, but it loses a lot. You see that hyperbole, this is a perfect car, you want a car dealership, you start kicking tires, they want to sell it to you, it's the greatest car ever made, right? If $50,000 fell out of the sky and hit Bob on the head, he might consider going and getting another new car a year and a half, two years later, right? Why? His wife would be like, no, he would not. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what that's what we look at. She's using the car. I love that. Having said all that, that hyperbole of this is going to be the greatest thing ever takes over human ideas. And the same thing has happened here. These women come out of the streets and they say, David is the savior. He is the one. 10,000 people he's killed. As far as we know, he killed one and some lions and tigers, right? Verse 8 is where it turns. Go ahead, Father. That's the thing. Did 10,000 people die? Maybe. Possibly. Then Saul became excited because David was so amazing. No, Saul became angry. For this saying displeased him. I can't imagine why. He said, they described to David 10,000s, but to me, they described thousands. Now, what more can he have but what? You see, he knows David is king and waiting. He knows that. He already knows he's losing his entire kingdom to this boy. And now public sentiment has turned away from him as well. It's belittling, right? His pride is absolutely checked in. I've mentioned this a number of times, but as I get older, I see that coming up all the time. I was informed last uh, Saturday when I was climbing scaffolding and doing things that I was no longer 25, and I have to remind myself that's the case. This is kind of where Saul finds himself, where he says, I know what I've done. I know what I've accomplished. And he has this pride, and he knows the winds are turning, and it's happening too quick, right? And he gets mad. Now, what more can they give him about the kingdom? Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Notice twice now it says his presence twice. There's a reason why they keep saying that. I know that's not how it's written. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. He raved in the midst of the house. Yep, I'm getting there, Dusty. And was playing his harp with his hand as usual and there was a spear in Saul's hand. There's two questions here. I don't even know what Dusty's question is. I'll get there. Um, Number one is, this has been a normal thing. What was David's job at this point? You guys catch it? It was just briefly stated. It'll come up a couple more times as we read through it. Yep. When Saul would get upset, he would call David. We don't, it doesn't say that here. It says it later, so we're kind of looking back. It, it, he would call David. David would play and soothe him. And so David would literally sit there, and he would play, and he would sing, and Saul would relax. Whatever stresses are happening, whatever mental illness he's going through, that would all come down, and he would be okay. This is what's happening. Now, the question Dusty has is right there at the beginning of verse 10. Now, it came out the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. Now, here's Dusty's question. Why in the world? <laughs> when I prepared this, I circled this in red and it said dusty. Okay, so the question is this. How is it that an evil spirit came from God himself? And this is going to bring us into theology. I got Pastor Don in the back. You can scream me down if you disagree. Here's how I see this. It's actually fairly clear. One is that all spirits, um, both, both evil spirits and angels that have not fallen, were both created by God. So they're all his. Let's start there. Even those that rebelled are still created by him. He still has control there. That's number one. Number two. Number two is that in the same way that he hardened Pharaoh's heart, this is exactly what I see here. You got to hold both of those things. Hold both those things in your mind. And I'm going to add one more. And that is that here, when we talk about an evil spirit coming forth from God, there's a difference between God saying, here is evilness coming from me into you, and God allowing a thing to happen. Think Job. Okay, I, I take all three of those concepts, um, and I would, um, 
principle we're using hermeneutically is called precepts. It means taking three ideas that all point the same way, even though you don't have a passage that says that directly, and pointed it this way. That's how I would explain how an evil spirit came from God to Saul. Now, the reason I'm okay with that is because God is trying to accomplish a thing through Saul. We've already said it for three weeks now. Who's the king incarnate? David, right? He's the one that's coming in. He's the one in waiting. And so that has to happen. And so uh, this idea that God has probed Saul into anger, um, I'm okay with because, I should say I'm okay with it, it doesn't matter if I'm okay with it or not. Uh, God's okay with it because it's all about getting his will done. Now, where that touches our lives, is it possible that the difficult struggle you're going through right now was approved in holy paperwork that you would go through it? Might be. You know, when people say the devil made me do it, you ever heard anybody say it? It always makes me laugh because that makes them very important. The devil's in one place at one time. However, on top of that, that also means God allowed me to struggle with this. We're a lot slower to say that, right? I'm a lot quicker to go, this evil spirit came against me. And a lot slower to go, God let me be in a bad spot. Because that second one makes it sound like God doesn't love us. At least from a human perspective. Pastor, I wondered if I was going to step on your theology. Go ahead, Pastor. Well, the only thing I would add to the degree of argument is that it's not about Saul that makes this possible. One more time. It's not about Saul. Exactly. If there happens to be something in Saul to make, and there's a reason, there, there has to be something in you already for the reaction to happen that's going to happen right now, right? Let's read what the reaction is, because this is going to happen multiple times. He was playing the harp with his hand as usual, and there was a spear in Saul's hand. Saul hurled the spear and thought, I will pin David to the wall. Now, what would it take to pin a person to the wall with a spear? It would have to go through you, right? Correct. The chances of living through this are low. What is Saul actually saying? I'm going to murder him, right? I'm going to murder him because he's more popular than me. Oh, he didn't say it that way because it's hard to say that about yourself, right? The people like this person more than me. I hope he dies. I like the Dodgers more than the Red Sox. I hope the Red Sox all get the flu next week. <laughs> you see... We think that when Saul tried to kill David, that's extreme. Yet if you're actually honest about yourself, pretty easy to slide into that, right? Then it goes on, it says, this happened, that David escaped from his presence how many times? Wow. We'll tell the second story here in a little bit. Um, it's so easy to slide from this person is doing well and I'm not to I hate that person and you want their downfall. It seems like it's not, and let me explain to you why. We're going to look at je jealousy. Last verse of the day. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 says this. For from within, out of the heart of man proceeds... Oh, man. Wait a minute. I don't like the next verses, right? Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts. You know, I always thought the evil thoughts that were in me came from something else, right? I tell my kids, be careful to what movie you watch, what music you listen to, what stuff you read, who you let influence you. Because evil stuff comes into you, right? Isn't that how we think about the world? I'm not saying none of those things are true. I'm not saying you're dirty everything around you, because eventually you're going to let your mind go. But who did it come from, according to Mark? Inside, Inside us. Fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries. Anybody want to stand up for any of those things or say that those are okay? Probably not, right? Everyone's kind of like, I think we all agree. That's a problem. Deeds of coveting, wanting other people's stuff. That's an interesting to include in this. Wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality. Envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. I guarantee if you were to pick two things in that list, they go, well, those aren't so bad. They're coming out of the second half of the list, right? Yet they've all been put together as one thing. Envy, slander, pride, and covetousness are listed alongside 
fornication, theft, murder, and adultery. And I'm going to ask you again, as I ask myself again, at what point does my life, do I slip from being proud of you for doing well and being jealous of what's going on in your life? When does that become envy and slander? When might I slide into my own pride so much so that I might make up something about you so I feel better about me, right? For Saul, it happened pretty quickly. He heard people celebrating David and he couldn't handle it anymore. And so he said, you know, I am the king. I have all kinds of authority. No one is going to put me in jail. I will just take care of this problem now, right? So where that leaves us is actually a little bit tricky. I've left you a couple questions at the end. I try to leave you with a couple questions and a couple verses to take home with you. Today's verse comes out of Isaiah chapter 43. The verse you're trying to get to is 19, but I put 1 through 19 to give you context. So tonight, um, if you have a moment and you want to do more study, it's a great place to read. But here are my two questions for all of us, myself included today. Is jealousy a struggle for you? And number two, how does change affect your emotions? Or dare I say, your actions? <laughs> because this all came about because there was change in Saul's life, there's change in David's life, there's change in Jonathan's life, and jealousy and emotion reared its head, probably on all sides. Let's be honest, David was probably pretty happy with himself, right? I'm guessing, I don't know that. And it wound up turning into what could have been murder, right? So are your changes in your life, even when they're painful, do you allow there to be joy? Or do you let your emotions get away with you because you hate change? Yes, I'm asking myself as well. I'm going to pray. If you do want prayer today for your life, maybe there's change coming. Maybe you're jealous that the neighbor got a brand new fence. I am. Um, then you can come forward, and I would love to pray with you over that. Don't forget, um, there is a quilt show immediately after with lots of food. Don't run away home unless you have something. You have to come and eat chili. Um, as soon as I'm done shaking hands, I'm going to come in and give all your instructions on how to deal with the chili stuff. So I'll be there. I promise. Lord God, I thank you. And pray.